the metabolism that occurs in our body and in living organisms is really a flow of energy. Catabolism, the process of breaking molecules down, releases energy that can be used to do work, while anabolism, the process of synthesizing molecules, requires the input of energy. And these two processes of catabolism and anabolism are in balance. So it's the flow of energy that determines the balance of metabolism. So when glucose gets oxidized, we know that glucose is a high energy molecule. So we're going to put it up here at the top of the energy diagram. And oxygen is needed this for the, the reaction. When it gets oxidized, it gets converted to low energy molecules like carbon dioxide and water. And so you see that during this process of catabolism, there's a loss of energy. And so the energy change is negative because there's a loss of energy. And we can calculate that energy for the oxidation of glucose. We know that the standard free energy is minus 686 kcals per mole. And from that, we can calculate the equilibrium constant. We can find that equation in any sort of standard textbook. Um, and it's 10 to the 500. So what that means is that when this reaction occurs, what's left at the end is a ratio of 1 of the reactants to 10 to the 500 of the products. That's an astronomical number. And if you wanted to reverse it, it, it would not be possible just by increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and water. In fact, if you wanted to reverse it for anabolism, you would have to have more than 10 to the 500 sum of the products to get any amount of glucose. So that's not a possible solution to synthesizing glucose in a living organism. So what happens is the oxidation of glucose gets broken down into many steps. Say A is glucose, and Z is uh, carbon dioxide and water. And each of those steps, you've also broken up the change in energy energy to smaller steps. So overall, you can see that the change in free energy is favorable because it's still minus 686 kcals per mole. But now there are intermediate steps that can be reversible. You may even have some steps like here going from B to C, which need an input of energy. But overall, the reaction is favorable. So how do we regulate that flow of energy? Let's take a look at this reaction between B and C. And as it's written now, this reaction is in equilibrium at a delta G naught of 0, because those reactants and products at standard conditions are the same. But if you were to increase the concentration of B, you can see now that the reaction would tend to go to C, because B is now higher than C, and energy would be lost, making it exergonic. And we can calculate how favorable that reaction could be with this relationship between delta G and delta G naught. For this reaction, B to C, the delta G naught is 0. And let's say now that our reactants are 10 times greater than our products. And we can plug this into the equation here. So we have the delta G naught of 0 plus 1.36 kcals per mole times the log of the products. Products are 1, and reactants are 10. So the delta G naught equals 0 plus 1.36 kcals per mole 
times minus 1, because the log of 1 over 10 is minus 1. So this is a favorable reaction, minus 1.36 kcals per mole. So just by increasing the amount of reactants, you can make this reaction that is close to equilibrium go in the forward direction. What about if we now increase the concentration of the product, C? We see from the diagram now that the energy of C is higher than the energy of B, so the reaction will go in the reverse direction. And again, we can calculate that. So now let's say our products are 10 and our reactants are 1. So now, again, the delta G naught is 0 plus 1.36 kcals per mole times the log. Now the products are 10, so we put 10 on the top, and the reactants are 1. So now the delta G is equal to 0 plus 1.36 kcals per mole times 1, because the log of 10 is 1. So now we have an endergonic reaction. It's endergonic means it, it will go in the reverse direction. So it's easy to reverse the direction of a reaction that's close to a delta G naught, where the delta G naught is close to 0, because you can just change the concentrations of substrates and reactants and change the direction of the reaction. So reactions with a small delta G, like between B and C here, a small delta G naught, are easily reversible. So it's possible to change the direction of reactants and products just by either increasing the reactant, and you could make the reaction go forward in that direction, or you can increase C and make the reaction go backward in this direction. And that's what you would want to happen if you were going to synthesize a molecule like glucose. None of these reactions occur rapidly on a time scale useful to organisms because there are kinetic barriers. We call this on this an activation energy here. So a large activation energy means the reaction is going to be slow. But we know that enzymes increase the rate of the reaction because they decrease the activation energy. So here with enzyme 1, you've decreased the activation energy here. So all of the reactions in metabolism require enzymes to make them proceed. But reactions that are reversible, like between B and C, so reversible reactions, the direction and whether they proceed is controlled by substrate. And we saw that when we looked at this reaction, that you could increase B and make the reaction go in the forward direction, or increase C and make it go in the reverse direction. But what about these reactions with large favorable changes in re free energy, like going from C to D? These are essentially called irreversible reactions, and there's a lot of energy loss if this reaction goes in the forward direction. So these are are enzyme regulated. So irreversible reactions are enzyme regulated. And one way that they're regulated is through feedback inhibition. So for instance, if the levels of B increased, they could feedback inhibit to enzyme 1 and slow that favorable reaction down. And this would be through an allosteric mechanism. So all of these enzymes that catalyze very favorable or irreversible reactions are allosteric enzymes. And you could also, if you have a very favorable reaction and the level of C in increases, there's feed-forward regulation. 
in that case there's a lot of C building up and it's an allosteric activator of enzymes downstream so that would be B forward regulation and finally many of these many of these enzymes at these committed or irreversible steps the enzyme levels are regulated So that's how the flow of energy and metabolism is regulated.